Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation is based on the passion narrative just read, the death and burial of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will see that the sinner does his best to avoid having to look at death, but that Jesus' death draws you near into the family of God. Again, the evangelists detail the gathering round Jesus' grave. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre, and other women also followed after and beheld how his body was laid. So far the text, let us pray. O Lamb of God, bless thy word, that we may trust in thee. Amen. When I first started out in the pastoral ministry, many of my oldest members were the children of first-generation immigrants from Russia. At that time, well into their 90s, home visits were filled with stories reminiscing of childhood spent playing with scores of siblings and cousins, as it was not uncommon for each German-Russian household to have a dozen children or more. At some point, out would come the stack of old family photos to point out to me and name all this extended family now mostly departed this life. One peculiar feature, though, of those early 1900s photographs, more often than not, smack dab in the middle of at least 50 relatives, young and old, was a corpse. Everyone posed, standing either behind or to the sides, little children seated cross-legged beneath an open coffin. Eventually on one of these visits I had to ask, why are all your family portraits taken at funerals? It was explained to me we always hired a photographer for a funeral. Back then, it was the only time the whole family got together. Everyone came. The only occasion for which the farm reliably shut down and everyone, absolutely everyone, gathered together. And front and center of each of these photos, no hiding it, the reason they did. Remnants of that culture, which embraced death as reason to gather, remnants of that culture lingered out there in Montana for some years to come. Funerals my early years as pastor, you could count on easily one, 200 people in attendance. Hours of visitation beforehand, open coffin was the assumption line up to view the corpse stretching well out the church doors. It was also not uncommon for a few older German-Russian women to attend with camera in hand, carrying on that seemingly morbid tradition by snapping one last shot of the deceased before I close the coffin. This by no means is still the case. In 21st century America, death is increasingly something our culture avoids having to look at at all costs. Nowadays, open coffin itself increasingly rare. Who would ever think of bringing a camera along to snap a few pictures? No longer the assumption of hundreds gathering together. I've had funerals for souls who lived nine decades on earth with less than a dozen people in attendance. Not even all the children show up to their own parents' funeral. More and more opting for no service at all. A sad scene 
your Savior experiences himself in the Passion narrative tonight. As in the snapshot of Jesus' funeral, we find in all four Gospels, it is explicitly called out how very few souls showed up to bid him farewell. Certainly not the crowds from when he entered Jerusalem atop a donkey had his death happened but a few days earlier. There would have been hundreds in attendance, a lineup of family and community friends a mile long, replete with children playing about with palm branches in hand. What a difference one week can make. Of the 12 disciples who had spent every waking hour of the past three years with him, only one, John, is found anywhere near the grim scene of his final hours. The rest scattered in betrayal and fear, incapable of physically bringing themselves to look this death in the face, a death in which they each played their part. In the background of this photo, you catch a glimpse of a few women set out watching from a distance such that they can just barely make out the details by squinting their eyes. The pallbearers, two unrelated acquaintances, Joseph, Nicodemus, who keep their friendship a secret <clears throat> until after his eyelids close in death, and perhaps still keep it a secret a while more. Roman soldiers, they show up in number, but of course, they were paid to be there. And the most vocal presence, priests and Pharisees, who rattle on how they want Jesus buried as fast as possible, the tomb secured, a guard set watch, no viewing, no visitation. Who put them in charge of his arrangement? All of which makes Jesus' funeral as sad a scene as funerals are starting to become today. No more the grand gatherings of old, less and less and less in attendance. No children seated in front of the coffin. Leave them at home. They're too young to have to see or learn any of this. No, I won't go to the funeral. There'll, there'll be way too many people there. I'll see the family later when I can spend more time with them. But when you do, talking about anything else, because it's probably best not to bring that topic back up. Open coffin, cremation's not just cheaper. What's the point if you can't get people to commit enough to actually show up and look? Because every soul somewhere in the mind wants to think that death, that, that somehow death just isn't real. At best, that death is something which happens to other people. Only because death is something which has not happened to me yet. But the grim fact all this runs from in vain, which no one wants to openly look in the eyes, is that everyone dies. A reality we sinners have been very bad at owning up to from the beginning. From the first funeral, Abel's sad burial in the dirt where a father had to dig his own son's grave, and half the family, at least Cain and his wife, half the family can't show the decency to show up for the day, nor years later for the day of Adam's own funeral. To the mass burial of every living soul except eight. And in the aftermath, Noah tries to leave it all in the past by holding a wake of sorts, getting drunk, so soon forgetting his own mortality and the end he too would someday face. No, death does not draw us near, 
neither to the departed nor to our God. Only he can overcome this our aversion and gather us together by providing a reason and hope far greater than the obvious corpse in our midst. As we find later on in Genesis, a funeral almost like those German-Russian gatherings of old. When the patriarch Jacob drew his baker's dozen of grown children near to pose beside and behind his deathbed, little ones seated round about, and hear of a relative yet to come, a relative who would truly be worthy of their respect. When Jacob prophesied, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That word Shiloh means hero. In delivering his own funeral sermon, Jacob teaches his children and us that all the honor they give him is meaningless unless they gather round Shiloh and pay respect by faith to the hero to come who would come and lay down his life for ours. Which means looking on and pondering this picture of Jesus' burial is the only confidence for you to draw near any grave, to overcome that which we increasingly try our best not to see. As the scriptures declare, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many unto salvation. More important, then, than counting on one hand the number who gathered for Jesus' funeral is that you are counted among those in attendance now and find in him the Savior of all mankind, the forgiveness and life which cast far from you any fear of death or grave. For it was not the priests and Pharisees who were left in charge of Jesus' arrangements, but his father and yours, who had prepared every detail for the burial of his son in order to give you eternal hope. Yes, in that sad scene recorded by all four evangelists with Polaroid precision, you see no lineup of mourners, no fanfare, nor flowers. But what is captured is the peculiar irony that though Jesus is crucified as a criminal, he somehow ends up with the fanciest burial plot money could buy. All in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And he made his grave with the wicked, yet with the rich in his death. The same fallen hero of whom Isaiah declares the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And again, he will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. Because if, as the scriptures say, the sting of death is sin, then the suffering, groaning, Bleeding, dying, Jesus endured to the grave in order to atone for your sin and mine. Make his death your eternal life. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, maybe they should have taken a few pictures that day. Because when those women who washed from afar Finally, two days later, do draw near, get brave enough to gather together where their fallen hero lay. There was no more to see. No more to see, only to believe 
that on account of his victory over sin in the grave, death no longer has any power over you. As we sing here, I will stand beside thee, from thee I will not part. Mine eyes shall then behold thee, upon thy cross shall dwell. My heart by faith enfold thee, who dieth thus, dies well. Yes, so few came together for Jesus' burial. Sad funeral it was. But by the grace of God, here you are, just as much a part of the picture. Join to the household of faith, the family of God. Never shy away from this gathering, because each occasion you draw near, the word of Christ and him crucified, your God's the one who shows up with camera in hand. Take a picture of the last longer. These snapshots captured in his photographic memory. Snapshots of your time spent at the foot of the cross. They last for eternity. The good news that regardless wherever, whenever, you've refused to show up as you should, he who sees all things, remembers and points you out by name as his precious redeemed child and sees you in his mind's eye right where you need to be. Now the peace that passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.